Okay, I think we will go ahead and get going. Thanks to everyone for joining today's ECSS symposium. Uh, you're in for a, a real treat. This is a really fascinating project. I want to thank uh, David O'Neill from the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center uh, for being our ECSS staff member involved in this project and also uh, kind of taking the lead on this presentation today. We're very fortunate to have also the PI from the project, uh, Curtis Marion from Arizona State, uh, fresh off the plane from South Africa just last night with us, so that's terrific. And also campus champion fellow um, Eric Shook, who's now at University of Minnesota. So we're really pleased to have um, this wider ECSS team on the, on the call today. Um, I probably won't do much to introduce the work here, especially since we have the, the PI on the call. Um, at the very least, all I can do is embarrass myself <laughs> compared to his knowledge of this uh, subject. But it's really, it has to do with the origins of the human species and how paleoclimate um, informs um, our knowledge of where that origin could occur. Um, and um, David and Eric have played some really unique roles contributing to this project, and I think it's what is quite a new area um, for high performance computing. So maybe when, uh, when Curtis is speaking, he can say a little bit about how he came to even think about this as, as something to incorporate uh, in the work. And really, uh, from there, I will let um, David take it away. I think he's going to manage the, uh, the other speakers. And thank you very much to all of our presenters today. Thanks, Nancy. I guess we can just blow right by these. You've already introduced Curtis and Eric and me, so I think Curtis can take it away. Okay, so what I thought I'd do is start with um, some of the background on the research question. And uh, what I'm gonna do with this slide, which is a slide I have to update probably every six months because we make, we're making enormously fast progress on understanding um, the human origin story. Um, and this is gonna give you kind of the biological background relative to a very broad um, climate context. Uh, so, we're talking about um, the latter phase of human origins. So we're talking about the origins of modern humans, uh, the species that, uh, is, that we belong to and dominates the planet today. And at the bottom of this slide, I've put a proxy for global temperature that's taken from the Epica ice cores. Um, and that record goes back almost to 800,000 years ago. And uh, that's the Delta Deuterium record. And when that line is higher uh, up in the red area, uh, the world is in an interglacial. And of course, we're in the Holocene today and that, that is a, an interglacial phase. And when that line is down below in the blue, where it says cold, we're in a glacial phase. And um, one of the take home messages from that graph that you see there is that the majority of the later phases of human evolution, the world has been in a glacial phase and we're currently in an interglacial. So uh, the planet was a very, very different place, both in terms of sea level and temperature and vegetation than it was, than it is today. And to understand modern human origins, we have to understand what those climates were like and how those climates shaped the vegetation and, and uh, uh, faunal ecosystems that, that people were a part of. So that, that's what we're trying to do in, in Southern Africa. And then the, the graph that you see above, I've simplified the human origin story a little bit, but it's, it's not simplified to the point of, of being wrong. Um, and I've broken the lineages of uh, humans that have been present in the last 800,000 years into two basic groups, which we call the Eurasian archaic lineage and the African um, archaic lineage. And when those lines end in circles, what that means is it ends in extinction. And what we know from both the fossil record and the genetic record is both major lineages share a last common ancestor somewhere back around 800,000 years ago. 
And if you've heard of Homo erectus, um, that's likely that last common ancestor that, that is shared um, by everyone. And then sometime around 700,000 years ago, those two lineages start to separate into a Eurasian lineage and an African lineage. You can go to the next slide, please. And we know that from around 800,000 years ago to about 400,000 years ago, there was gene flow um, between those two lineages. And that gene flow was probably taking place by populations moving in and out of Africa um, through uh, Egypt, currently Egypt, or the Sinai Peninsula. That's the primary connector point. Next slide. And then around uh, 400,000 years ago, that gene flow between those two lineages gets cut. And uh, we don't really know why that happened, but I think it probably was because of the, the formation of the Sahara. And of course, you know, if you ever look at a map, um, the Sahara is, extends naturally into the Arabian Peninsula, into the Negev Desert in, currently in Israel. So um, when that desert formed, it became very, very diff difficult for populations to move in and out of Africa because they didn't have water carrying technology that would allow them um, to do that. And we okay there? Yeah, let me, uh, can you mute please if you're not speaking and I will try to mute as well. Okay, so um, when that gene flow gets cut, of course, uh, those two lineages begin to move in different directions, what we would call uh, speciate. Next slide. And around, you know, sometime between 400 and 300,000 years ago, a lineage breaks off, uh, and this one was recently found um, from genetic work that was done on a finger bone of a, of a fossil from a cave in the Altai Mountains in Russia, and we call that lineage the Denisovan lineage, and this would have been uh, a, a ultimately a, a population of near modern humans that lived in eastern Eurasia. Next slide. And you've probably all heard of Neanderthals. The Neanderthal lineage appears sometime around 350,000 years ago, and they become the dominant hominin in uh, Western Eurasia, and their primary area seems to be what we now call Europe. Next slide. And then uh, the modern human lineage, that's the lineage that leads to everybody alive on the planet today, appears sometime between 200 and 150,000 years ago, and uh, we have concordant data on that from both the fossils and the genetics uh, of modern humans. Next slide. And then, and then around 70,000 years ago, a very small founder population of Africans, uh, so modern humans, leaves Africa, uh, probably through the Sinai, and they spread uh, east toward uh, uh, Eastern Asia, and they spread west into uh, Europe. Next slide. And then those two lineages radiate into all the modern lineages, what you can think of as ethno-linguistic groups today of Africans and Eurasians. So all Eurasians are descended from that very small founder population that leaves Africa around 70,000 years ago. And by small, I mean a couple hundred people. Um, next slide. And when that founder population leaves Africa, they encounter Neanderthals, and there are uh, a couple of interbreeding events, hybridization events, and the founder population picks up um, some Neanderthal DNA from that hybridization such that all Eurasians have some Neanderthal DNA, you know, all varying between, let's say, 4 and 7% of their DNA comes from Neanderthals. Next slide. And uh, that lineage then radiates into all those many, many Eurasian lineages that we see today, ethnolinguistic groups. Next slide. And the uh, Melanesians, which include Aborigines and people from Papua New Guinea, um, as their, the group that led to them was crossing Eastern Asia, they encountered Denisovans and interbred with Denisovans and picked up um, snippets of Denisovan DNA, which is still with them today.
Next slide. And then there's even a, uh, another hybridization event where the archaic African lineage, which was still hanging on around somewhere in Africa, uh, we do know that it was in West Africa, we're not sure how, how broadly spread it was, interbreeds with modern humans, modern Africans, such that Africans picked up um, some snippets of that ancient DNA. So, uh, and finally, um, as you can tell from what happens here, the only lineage that survives is the lineage of modern humans. So the archaic African lineage, the, Ar the archaic Eurasian lineage, Denisovans and Neanderthals all go extinct. And that's an absolutely fascinating story of how that happened. Uh, we're starting to close in on the answers, but we don't have all the answers. But one lineage survives, and that's us. Next slide, please. So the question that we've been addressing is um, how and why and where did that lineage occur? Now, we have some very basic projections of what Africa looked like um, during uh, the period when our lineage appears, and that, um, uh, that uh, would have been what we call um, isotope stage six between 195 and 123,000 years ago. And during glacial phases, most of Africa is hyper-arid. So if you look at that map, you can see the Sahara is twice as big as it is today. Uh, the, the Namib and Kalahari deserts are connected and much bigger than they are today. And the Central African rainforest was uh, restricted to some refugia um, and mostly gone and, and was a grassland ecosystem. So I've argued that there are probably somewhere between four to six potential uh, places for the progenitor lineage. And the genetics suggests that only one of those gives rise to modern humans. So one of those locations is the origin point for our lineage. Next slide. And I've hypothesized for a variety of reasons that that lineage appeared on the South African coast. Next slide. Now, the re reason for that hypothesis is that it, it's basically an ecological potential hypothesis that the food resources that we find on the South Coast um, are super rich and importantly resistant to the glacial phases that would have been present at that time and thus would have formed a perfect refugium. And I wrote a scientific paper uh, outlining that hypothesis in the Journal of Human Evolution. And then I wrote a general public version of that paper, which appeared in Scientific American in 2010 and has been reprinted a, a variety of times. Next slide. So uh, there are a couple of things that are unique about the Southern Cape. One of them is, is the world is broken up into six floral kingdoms. And as you can see here, uh, the Cape is its own floral kingdom. It is super unique. It has an extreme mega diversity of plants. Next slide. And one of the plant types that it is extremely rich in is plants with underground storage organs, an example of which you can see on the right hand side. And these are plants that essentially store carbohydrate in little tubers underground. And the reason they do that is because they are in a winter rainfall regime. And winter rainfall regimes, of course, have very hot, dry summers. And these little tubers of, carb of energy storage below ground are an adaptation to these hot, um, dry summers. But importantly for us, they are the focus of collection by hunter-gatherers because hunter-gatherers can dig them up with simple technologies and then they find basically a rich source of energy there. And as you can see, uh, the Cape, which is um, in the upper left-hand side of that graph, uh, has an enormous high diversity of these, of what we call geophyte species. There are about 2,400 species of them in, in South Africa, and that is way, way above any other winter rainfall regime um, anywhere in the planet. And winter rainfall regimes tend to have the highest diversity of these plants. Next slide. And then uh, the South African coast also has one of the richest intertidal zones in the world. And one of the driving causes of that, that richness 
is the collision of the warm Agullis current that comes down from the Indian Ocean with the cold Benguela upwelling, which creates this mix of cold and warm water that creates a, a very high diversity and high biomass of collectible intertidal shellfish. Next slide. So here's an example of what those shellfish beds look like. And uh, if you've got the cognition to figure out how to collect that food um, safely, you now have a very rich source of protein. Next slide. So when we add these two together, uh, you have a rich source of protein and a rich source of carbohydrate. The protein in the intertidal zone, the carbohydrate, easily collectible with a digging stick in the, in the, on land, um, creating the perfect diet. And importantly, both of these food resources would be immune to glacial pulses because uh, the shellfish biomass goes up with colder water and, of course, um, the below ground tuberous plants are adaptations to dry conditions and Africa would have been drier during the glacial phases. Next slide. But this system obviously was not static because one of the first slides I showed you was that the world's climate is constantly in flux. Uh, today uh, we're in the interglacial, but in the past we were in a glacial. Next slide. And the origin point of our lineage uh, indicated by that blue bar was during one of the longest, coldest glacial phases on record that we call marine isotope stage um, six. So the world would have been a very, very different place at that time. Next slide. So in the past, what we've done in the paleosciences is we've relied on what we call informal models. And in um, a paper co-authored with many of my colleagues, we argued that we need to move from a reliance on informal models to formal models of climate and vegetation. Um, and of course, formal models are where are models that are that are developed from from mathematics. So climate change was massive, and instead of relying on these informal models of what that climate change would look like we've argued that we need to harness the power of our, of our climate models to make um, project formal models of the past. Next slide. Okay, and that's the paper where we argued this for this research strategy. It's published in Evolu Evolutionary Anthropology, peer review journal. So here's an example of, uh, of an informal paleoscape model. Uh, during warmer climates um, in Southern Africa, the coast would be nearby, and of course, the Holocene is a good example of that. We know that uh, today we have more winter rain, and in that area, there would be grasses following the C3 photosynthetic pathway, which are winter rain grasses and uh, a, a more winter rain western flora. And then what archaeologists would typically do, um, we would then create a uh, kind of an informal picture of what a cold climate would look like, and that's below. So it, during the colder climates, because sea level is lower, you would have a grassy plain around the caves. Uh, the coast would be far away, and we think that there would be more summer rain, so we'd have some changes in the climate system, and that would result in more C4 grasses and a more eastern flora, which is our, our eastern tropical African summer rain flora. But we can do better than this. So instead, what we've proposed is to create formal, what we call paleoscape models. So these are temporally dynamic models that project not only climate, but also the, the vegetation, and therefore the resources that are meaningful to hunter-gatherers. And we've argued that those models need to have three basic components. Um, for example, a structural component that would provide precise estimates of how far the coast was. Was it 20 kilometers away or 40 kilometers or 80 kilometers away? It would then have a food availability component. We would project uh, what resources were available to a hunter-gatherer, the shellfish and the bulbs and the seeds and what their return rates would be. And then also a techno research component, resource component. So where was the stone for flaking uh, 
where did they get the um, the tree sap to make glues, which allow them to glue the stone tools onto the wood handles. And then we would use those formal models to create quantifiable hypotheses of human behavior, and then insert, and using agent-based modeling, um, a forager into such an environment guided by the principles of a theory called behavioral ecology, which is a quantitative theory of behavior, um, to create uh, quantifiable hypotheses of what people should do in such an environment. So this is an extremely optimistic uh, approach to um, modeling behavior in a formal way where we couple climate change to vegetation change to landscape change to human behavior change. Next slide, please. So in 2010, we published a paper in Quaternary Science Reviews, it's a peer-reviewed journal, where we gave an example of step one of a paleoscape model that was led by Dr. Eric Fisher, where we built a three-dimensional model of the offshore platform, and we built into that model um, the last 400,000 years of sea level change to create pre precise estimates of the distance to the coast. Next slide, please. And uh, here's a 3D model of what the current South African coast looks like um, with the offshore platform present. So we're gonna try to run this uh, animation for you. Go ahead. Okay, there it goes. So as it turns sideways, you can see that the offshore platform off of South Africa is very gradual in its descent. And so what that means is, is when sea level is lower during these glacial phases, that coastline moved very far away. So for example, during the last glacial maximum 18,000 years ago, and in isotope stage six, 150,000 years ago, the coast was 95 kilometers away where today the, the coast is right there at the caves. Next slide. So this is a graph of the output of that model. Uh, the data points are the distance to the coastline, um, the distance in kilometers on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is the thousands of years ago from 419,000 years ago to the present. So if you look at marine isotope stage six, let's say at 140,000 years ago, you can see that the model shows us that the coastline was 95 kilometers away. So these are massive climate changes with huge landscape impacts that we are trying to model. But this is actually simple. Trying to model where the coast is simple compared to trying to model uh, climate change. Next slide. So here's what, uh, just a, an informal picture of what um, the South African coast would look like during a full interglacial that's above today, and what it would look like during a full glacial below at the bottom. And so essentially during a glacial, we add a landmass the size of Ireland to the South African coast. Next slide. Okay, so I'm now gonna turn it over uh, to the next speaker. Thanks, Curtis, I had to unmute there. Okay. <clears throat> So I am going to discuss some interesting uh, characteristics of something called the Conformal Cubic Atmospheric Model, CCAM. My, uh, it's not moving for some reason. Hmm. Here we go. Okay, so the conformal cubic atmospheric model is a global model, and it's also a regional model. This is kind of a crucial characteristic of this code. Um, I'll show you some pictures here, but it can be configured in a stretched mode um, for variable resolution in regional model, model 
or in a quasi-uniform mode for global modeling. Uh, it was the first implementation of its type and the only such climate model developed in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, CCAM is developed by the Oceans and Atmosphere Unit of the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research, Research Organization. Uh, CICERO is the Federal Government Agency for Scientific Research in Australia. Uh, there is a similar organization in some ways. Uh, in South Africa, the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research and its Center for High Performance Computing. Um, CSIR is South Africa's premier scientific research and development organization. And our collaborator, uh, Francois Engelbrecht, is a CSIR staffer. So, we'll take a look at a kind of familiar latitude-longitude type grid on a sphere. The uh, problem with this is um, when it comes to modeling is there are stability problems at the poles. Um, increasingly smaller time steps must be specified and so when you're looking at the entire globe uh, these calculations become extremely inefficient uh, near the equator so the key observation is we can utilize something called a conformal cubic grid realized by projecting a cube onto the surface of the sphere. So we see the north and south poles, and I take it that equator one region is on the face towards the uh, viewer. Uh, note that you can see the eight corners of a face, the equator one face in this in this image. Uh, this is uh, an image of a quasi-uniform conformal cubic grid uh, overlaid on the surface of the Earth. And I've got arrows here pointing to where the corners are. Um, this is the type of grid that CCAM uses for its global models. Uh, in 1998, so this is a relatively recent code, uh, CCAM became the first atmospheric global climate model based on this conformal cubic grid idea. Now, I had mentioned before about stretching grids. In, in this image on the left, we see four of those corners of one of the faces. Oh, it's essentially over top of Australia. And you can also see the other four points surrounding it, where the resolution is very high compared to the rest of the uh, surface of the planet. Uh, on the right-hand side, there's even a finer focus over the um, southeast coast of Australia. And you can still see these eight corners there. And of course, the rest of the surface of the planet is um, at a very low resolution by comparison. Uh, so a few details about the code itself. Uh, there are roughly 150,000 lines of Fortran 90 source code. Uh, there are a couple of small C functions. Uh, there are no shared memory multiprocessing features. So there's no thread space stuff 
um, all of our all of our runs are have been up to date anyway on Stampede Sandy Bridge uh, nodes. We're using Intel compilers and MFA Pitch Two. Uh, I recently completed a KNL port uh, to see what that was going to mean. And of course, the absence of shared memory multiprocessing features is an obstacle there. Uh, another bigger obstacle maybe is that documentation on CCAM is kind of sparse. Uh, some project specific characteristics. Um, I mentioned all runs of you Sandy Bridge nodes. Uh, the global simulation, so these are low resolution. They're using something called a C48 grid, which is a cubic type grid, and each face has 48 by 48 grid points. Uh, these are solved on 48 cores. The regional simulations, the high resolution stuff, they are using a C160 grid. Here it's 160 by 160 grid points on a face. The six, the trailing six, because this came from the cube, we've got six of these faces. And these simulations are using 768 cores. Now this is a description of what we're doing right now. Uh, last year, this stuff was different. I can't cite exactly how, but basically the core counts were about the same. Uh, some of the challenges, um, CCAM uh, has a number of restrictions on the way that core counts can be specified. The first one is, it's got to be a multiple of six. Uh, there's also uh, factoring involved that I don't quite understand yet, but it also restricts the number of cores that can be applied to specific grids. Um, the programming logic in general, uh, it relies heavily on indirect addressing. And so this is a problem for vectorization. Uh, and therefore, it's especially a problem for a KNL port. Uh, the code has a significant I.O. component. Oh, and I see I've repeated here that documentation is sparse. Uh, profile light. Uh, this is examining things like optimization and vectorization reports that the uh, iFort compiler will spit out for you. Um, GProf runs show that, in general, the routines within the code are well balanced. Uh, one thing that popped up that was kind of unexpected was that um, <coughs> there's a function, it's associated with the MPI libraries. It's called uh, Intel Memset. And so it suddenly appears and starts taking, oh, say 10% of the compute cycles. So this is something we'll have to take a closer look at. Uh, Pappy um, shows uh, modest megaflop rates, around 10% of peak. So you know, while things are well balanced and and all that, it's not setting any speed records. Uh, MPIP uh, profiling showed um, the most significant time spent in gather and wait. And I suppose that's something that would be expected as well. Uh, scalability. Uh, this chart was produced by the um, Australia Supercomputing Center on a system called Magnus. Um, I did a little digging to see what Magnus was. It is a um, 
a Cray XC40, uh, a one petaflop machine with about, uh, I think it has about 35,000 cores. Uh, these these uh, scalability curves go out to about 25,000. Um, oh, I should mention that the x-axis, these are core counts. Um, these are also very large grids. C768 is um, much larger than what we're using right now. These would have been more like benchmarking problems, I suppose. Uh, I.O. details. Um, there are eight ensemble members for global and regional resolutions, uh, each simulating 100 years. Um, each core writes files for its subdomain. So we end up with about 58,000 files for global simulations and you know, closing in on a million files for a regional simulation. And these counts are for each ensemble member. Uh, the ensemble file sets are archived and then saved to tape and aggregate data size ends up being about 12 terabytes. Uh, data management. <clears throat> so all project data is ultimately moved to Arizona State. Uh, we used globus.org to connect Ranch with the data mover system at Arizona State Advanced Computing Center. Um, that's the fastest connection we could find that was near to ASU. Uh, files are then copied to a dedicated departmental server that I think that Curtis manages. And some of these file sets have been hand carried to South Africa by Curtis for post-processing by Francois, our collaborator. Oh, and I've reached the point where I'm going to hand this off to Eric. Thank you, David. Um, so I came into this project uh, in 2013 as a Campus Champion Fellow. And for those of you who, who don't know, uh, Exceed has a few hundred Campus Champions uh, across the U.S. that serve as local sources of knowledge about national, including Exceed, and local CI uh, resources available for researchers. And uh, as part of the Campus Champion program, they have a, a fellows program uh, that provides support for, for about a year to work with an Exceed project and ECSS members to gain valuable skills. Uh, so I was actually partnered with the Paleoscape project, um, and it was a uh, uh, I was very fortunate to be put on to such an interesting project and it was a really a, a good experience uh, as part of the the year-long fellowship project uh, I, I both traveled to ASU uh, met with uh, Curtis and the team and I also was able to travel to South Africa for a paleoscape workshop where we actually sketched out uh, quite a bit of the stuff um, that that you see in this presentation on the computational side kind of informed quite a bit of the research the picture you see in the, the bottom right, I think Curtis does a disservice by not showing pictures of his beautiful cave site sitting on the ocean. <laughs> uh, so so he, he allowed us to, to do a tour of the, of the sites uh, and it's a, it's, a gorgeous, it's a gorgeous dig site. Um, so I've been on the project since about 2013 uh, and next slide. Um, and my, my role as a, as a fellow was kind of two pieces. The first was to uh, parallelize the agent-based models, uh, which is all the way at the end of this pipeline. Uh, and I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. And then the, the other aspect uh, of my role as a Campus Champion Fellow was really to help develop a, a computational workflow. So as Curtis was talking about, there's a lot of moving pieces to this project. We have the CCAM, uh, the climate model at the beginning, uh, those data are then passed to vegetation models. Uh, we have two different models uh, based on essentially competing theories with, with how we should model uh, 
uh, vegetation and we're going to feed that data into these vegetation models uh, and get uh, a diverse set of data uh, regarding what does the vegetation look like uh, in South Africa. And then those need to really be translated into something that uh, Curtis and his team called resource scapes. So what are the actual resources that come out of this vegetation in terms of uh, potential for tools, for food, uh, for game, etc. So from those we get uh, abundance rates, maybe a vegetation, return rates in terms of if you're going to go hunting, what's your chance of actually getting um, an animal, for example. And then all of that data eventually is fed into agent-based models. Uh, and I emphasize models because, um, again, there's, there's multiple different perspectives that we can look at some of this, uh, so, some of the human behavior uh, and movement patterns and I, I can get into that in a little bit um, so so those were kind of my my two initial roles as as a fellow and uh, the if we go to the next slide uh, part of the the challenge as uh, Curtis Curtis alluded to is really trying to figure out how to actually couple these models. So these models, most of them operate at different spatial scales, different temporal scales. Uh, so we need to make sure that we can um, connect them together, both from a technical perspective, which is mostly engineering in terms of transforming the data, making sure that the outputs matches the input, which is uh, very familiar to probably to this crowd in terms of workflow management. But we also have to make sure that as we're doing these data modification that they match the scientific perspective that we're actually making sure that we're not uh, losing any data as we're doing some of these transformative pieces. So, uh, so some of my role is actually making sure that uh, as we're doing these data transformation from the climate model to the vegetation model to the transformers to the agent-based models, that everything is done uh, as uh, you know, appropriately as possible and uh, in order to help do this, uh, part of my research is actually developing a new, what we call a domain-specific programming language for spatial temporal data processing that's going to help couple these models. I have a graduate student right now that's uh, processing some of the climate data, that 12 terabytes of climate data that David was talking about. Um, that, that will eventually be fed into these, these vegetation models uh, that we have going right now, and then everything will get pushed downstream. Uh, and then eventually, once we're ready from the vegetation models, uh, this, this language will probably also be used for the, the resource scape transformers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one challenge uh, with, with a project uh, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with is it's interdisciplinary. And unlike probably the, the traditional users of HPC, our bioinformatics, uh, you know, atmospheric modeling, chemistry, um, and a lot of physics and engineering. Uh, many of the scientists on this project are field researchers, uh, social scientists, and many of them are not comfortable with the command line. Uh, so one of the, the new aspects of this project is we're trying to pilot test using Jupyter notebooks. Um, so I know that these are starting to gain uh, kind of more and more momentum on the HPC side. And for those of you who haven't heard of Jupyter Notebooks, it's kind of a, a web application where you create these uh, kind of computational notebooks where you can include documentation, you can include code, you can include data, you can include visualizations, all in one interface. Uh, so what we're doing right now is actually exploring using notebooks as kind of the, the user interface for this Paleoscape project. And we're very fortunate to have uh, David Delvento from NCAR, uh, who's really spearheading the, the deployment of this. And right now we're testing it on Jetstream. Uh, he's, it, this is fresh off the press. Uh, we started this uh, a week or two ago. Um, so, so we're pretty excited in order to... Uh, kind of boot up some of these Jupyter notebooks in order to get some of these scientists to be able to interact with the systems without having to resort to using command lines. Um, because what the workflow uh, diagram doesn't show is a whole bunch of, you know, kind of technical code that we have to do to process all of these data. Uh, 
Uh, and what's unfortunate about a lot of that code and running on the command line with the supercomputers is that the scientists who really have the expertise, uh, Curtis, uh, other paleoanthropologists, archaeologists, botanists, um, they, they don't necessarily have uh, the expertise nor the, the interest really to learn command line in a lot of ways. So if we can provide these easier to use user interfaces that provide us kind of a, a reproducible way of getting at the data and seeing the results, I think that this is gonna be a win for this project uh, and potentially something to look at for, for other projects as well. Uh, so next slide, please. So looking all the way at the end of this uh, workflow is the agent-based models. Um, and there's a lot of data that's going into these agent-based models. The, the screenshot that you see is actually based on uh, a, a model developed for the Ache hunter-gatherers in uh, Paraguay. And in addition to this model um, that has decades of field data driving it, uh, Curtis and his team has actually been collecting data in the field to inform return rates for those uh, geophytes, the, the USOs, on what, how many calories would you get if you went out uh, into the field to try to actually forage for some of these plants, as well as what would we expect from calories in terms of if we went out hunting for some of the species. Uh, and we have a climate modeler, uh, Colin Wren, I see, uh, the image is courtesy of him, it's, it's hidden in the bottom of the slide. Um, our, our the, this, this update is, is from him, he's our primary agent-based modeler. Um, and hopefully we'll be ready to run these agent-based models by summer 2017. Uh, and once they're ready to run on Exceed, we're gonna be running thousands and thousands of simulations to answer these basic questions about human movement and behavior. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of considerations that we're looking at these agent-based models, and I'm not going to go into details because I want to leave uh, a few minutes for, for questions uh, if, there are, if, if we do that. Um, but there's, there's a lot of different aspects to this that uh, these formal models that Curtis was talking about can help us to understand um, in terms of what do these groups do? Uh, so in the agent-based models, we have the idea of a camp. It's kind of a group of individuals. And questions regarding how often do they move? When they do move, how far do they go? And in terms of individual decisions, uh, should I go hunting today or should I go for forage for, um, for food? Uh, of course, there's trade-offs in terms of calorie returns, the success rates, uh, whether you're going to get carbohydrates or proteins. Uh, and then if you're going to decide to hunt, what should you hunt? There's lots of different choices. Um, so, so these are just some of the aspects that these formal agent-based models allow us to explore. And we're just beginning uh, on, on, this, on this path, but it's a very interesting one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the platform that we're using is, is NetLogo. Uh, it's easy to use agent-based modeling environment. It's very widely used in the sciences. Uh, it has an embarrassingly parallel functionality. Um, essentially, it runs uh, each simulation on a core, and it can do this uh, in a multi-threaded environment. But the problem with this project is we're gonna require hundreds of thousands of simulations to test all of these competing models, the various climate regimes, vegetation scenarios, et cetera. Uh, so what we've been doing is actually uh, increasing the parallelism of NetLogo uh, by developing kind of uh, our own workflow system to parallelize it. And if we go to the next slide, we have a uh, open source uh, code that allows us to take a model uh, from NetLogo, what we call an experiment, which is basically all of the parameters for these thousands of simulations and we have some Python scripts um, that basically break up this experiment into multiple jobs that can be run on uh, Exceed machines. It was originally tested on Blacklight. We moved it over to uh, Trestles and Comet and we're moving it back to Bridges uh, in a little bit. Uh, and this is a, one way that we're uh, scaling that logo, which is a pretty widely used agent-based modeling platform to run on these larger Exceed uh, systems. So that was another exciting development from the Fellows Project. It's, it's open source and available. Uh, I see the GitHub link uh, isn't on the slide, but um, if somebody sends me an email and is interested, uh, it's on GitHub. Uh, so it's freely available for anyone. 
And with that, I'll allow you to go to the next slide and uh, let either David or Curtis close with some comments. That is the last slide. Great, thank you very much, David, Curtis, Eric. Uh, fascinating talk, uh, didn't disappoint at all. Um, let me open up the floor first to other participants on the call. Uh, any questions for any of our speakers? I have a few if no one, uh, no one else does. I haven't seen anything come in on chat during the presentation. So let me give you a minute yes. here to unmute. Yeah? Nancy, this is uh, Sudhakar. <laughs> so can you hear me? Yes. I can. Go ahead, Sudhakar. Okay. Uh, the, the CCA model uh, with these, uh, you know, differing resolutions uh, is kind of focused around, you know, Australia, New Zealand or something. Is it because the, the code is actually written in Australia or you, are these grids movable around different locations on the globe. These are well, you, first, you uh, can place those faces. Yes. You can place that high resolution spot wherever you want. Mm -hmm. So you could actually move it too close to the, you know, the, the Cape region and then you can actually look at it more closely. Is that? Uh, is that yes, that, that, that is what we're doing. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Sudhakar. Questions? Yeah, we, uh, we actually have several simulations that have focused on the, the Cape region, both at the, the coarse resolution and the high resolution. Um, those were the slides that David was referring to. Um, those were actually focused in the kind of the southern tip of South Africa where these cave sites are located. Okay. Um, this is Mona. I have a question um, about the model. Usually in a modeling um, type of um, setting, there's a way to verify that the model's answers are correct or close to correct. Um, you talked a little, can you talk a little bit about whether or how you guys are going to verify the model results? Yeah, I can say a few words about that. Um, we, our field program has been doing a lot of uh, field-based paleoclimate and paleoenvironmental research uh, since 2003. And we've had a couple of large NSF grants to do that. So for example, I'll, I'll, just, take one exa I'll just take one example of the type of work that we do. Uh, one of the best archives for terrestrial ancient climate is stalagmites. So stalagmites are cave formations that grow from drippage of water and uh, the water, uh, when, it, when it contributes to the formation of the calcite that makes up that stalagmite, the water in the oxygen isotopes uh, preserves some information on the source region for the rain, uh, the season that the rain fell in, um, and even temperature. But also in the area of the carbon isotopes, as that drop of water works its way down through the soil, it picks up the carbon isotopes of the soil, which are reflective of the type of vegetation that's present on that soil. So we harvest stalagmites um, and cut them open and they will look and profile kind of like a tree ring and we can date them at pretty high resolution with a dating technique called uranium thorium dating uh, back to about half a million years ago and uh, then we can examine the isotopes, the oxygen isotopes, the carbon isotopes with mass spectrometry and build up uh, climate curves. And those climate curves and, and vegetation curves will include information on what season of the year the rain fell in, how, what the temperature was, and uh, what type of vegetation we had. And we can fill that out with studies of uh, large mammals, what kind of mammals we find in the sites, we can even look at the isotopes in their teeth. So uh, that creates a, an empirically based record of climate change um, and environmental change. And then we can test that. We can test the output of the computer models with that field data. 
But uh, what the, the weakness of the field data, you know, if you can think about it this way, is that it's point-based. So it gives us a record from one cave or one archaeological site. But then we have all that space in between uh, one cave that gives us a stalagmite record and another cave that gives us a stalagmite record. And one of the beauties of the climate models uh, and their projections of, of, of climate and also of the vegetation models that get, run, that get driven by the climate models is they fill in maps they f in the gaps in between these sites. So they give us a landscape-based record. So, we, so yeah, that's the answer. We use our field-based and laboratory-based archives of climate change and environmental change to test against the output of the, the global climate or, and regional climate models. Okay, thank you. Yep. Great, thanks, Curtis. Other questions? I was wondering where CCAM and the um, and NetLogo ran prior to running on Exceed resources um, and kind of what type of new insights you've seen from using the larger resources. And then also if you've seen interest from other anthropologists about using such an approach um, for other studies. Well, I would just say that the CCAM uh, normally runs on South Africa's high performance computing and um, they, they mostly devote that effort to, uh, you know, future climate projections for global climate change. They often uh, do it on a contractual basis for other, other uh, countries in Africa and so on. Um, so the, the, the real benefit here was that um, we were able to, so, so they don't have a lot of capacity to run experiments for human origins research. Let me put it that way. Um, most of it is applied. So the real benefit for us was we were able to build this collaboration where we could move it uh, to exceed resources, where we could use that model, which is mostly used in an applied context and use it for purely scientific type of work that um, we're doing. But I'll, but I'll add also that there is a, there's a, there's a feedback to them because one of the reasons they were interested in doing this is, uh, you know, cl climate simulations for the future to try to predict how South Africa will respond to climate change. Um, obviously, those projections are in the future. There's no way to validate those projections. Um, but what we can do is we can take their model and validate it with projections to the past by testing them against the empirical record of things like stalagmites and so on that I was just talking about, which is really interesting because it allows us to take our models that we're trying to predict the future and test their power by comparing it to conditions in the past. So this was one of the reasons the South Africans were really interested in this um, collaboration. Now, uh, what makes our, one of the things really unique is we're the first project, human origins project, to take a regional climate model uh, and use it to back forecast climate um, in the past. Uh, most of the work that has been done so far has taken fairly coarse-grained global climate models to predict uh, regional climate in the past. And that's really, we know, we know that that's inadequate um, because those models simply are not high resolution enough and powerful enough. We're really the first project to take a regional climate model. So uh, we, haven't, we haven't published any of our results yet, um, but you know, we, this year is going to be, this is the year that we had planned to start publishing. And uh, we have a couple of papers that we're working on now. Um, so there are a lot of people waiting to see, particularly the South African um, community, waiting to see the output. And I think in the next year or two, we're gonna start getting quite a bit of feedback on what we've done. Great, thank you very much, Curtis. Uh, 
hate to end this, but in the interest of time and letting everyone uh, get on to their, their next commitments, uh, we'll end this month's symposium. I want to thank all our presenters for a tremendous job. The recording will be up on the web in case you have colleagues who missed this um, and want to see it later, and also links to contact information for both ECSS staff and the PI. So if you think of questions later on, um, I'm sure our presenters would be happy to field those. So thank you very much, everybody, for taking time out of your day today to listen to this uh, Pleasure. fascinating talk. And thanks again to our presenters. Really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye.